Today at 3.48 a.m., a Ukrainian command cell had roughly 78 seconds to complete a naval strike. Planners described as unprecedented in complexity and consequence. Their objective was Port Olia 4 a cargo vessel reportedly carrying components sufficient to produce 200 Shahed-type strike drones. If the synchronized operation succeeded, Ukrainian planners assessed, it would deny the Russian front a massed wave of low-cost loitering munitions for months and create temporary operational breathing room for ground forces. If it failed, the shipment would replenish a key attrition weapon and risk overwhelming Ukraine's air defenses. This account integrates the operations transcript and AAR. Any third-party items are explicitly labeled as claimed. 24 hours earlier, intelligence in a Kyiv bunker flagged the Port Olia 4 as it entered the Caspian Sea. The ship was escorted under what planners estimated to be a $0.5 billion security umbrella. Multiple warships, anti-air systems, and aerial patrols. With under 48 hours until the vessel reached port, a conventional interdiction of the convoy was assessed as infeasible without unacceptable risk. Facing that problem set, planners identified one exploitable bias. Defenses were oriented upward toward air threats. Russian sensors were oriented toward airborne threats, leaving naval and sea level approaches comparatively unattended. Acting on that assessment, commanders authorized a high risk layered strike concept and released an unmanned surface vessel, USV, designated SE Abe, as the initial actor in a three vector assault. Over the next 24 hours, the CRB used electric propulsion in short 200-meter approach hops to minimize thermal and acoustic signatures, moving into an ambush locus on the convoy's path. By 3.40 a.m., eight minutes before 3.48, the CRB lay dead in the water with its systems active. The Ukrainian command displays the Russian convoy presented as a cluster of heat signatures advancing into the kill zone. The tactical window opened. The plan hinged on a three-vector deception and precise timing. Vector one of three, a spring-loaded decoy carrying a radar reflector and a heat source. This device was described as an inexpensive aerial imitator with a radar reflector and heat source designed to appear as an inbound cruise missile. The decoy immediately produced a high priority contact on convoy displays. Vector 2. At the same instant, the CB transitioned from stealth to a high speed kinetic approach. Its main engine ignited and the vessel accelerated toward the convoy at roughly 50 miles per hour at each minute H. The combination of an apparent airborne missile threat and a fast surface contact forced Russian crews and sensors to triage threats under severe time pressure. On the bridge of the escort corvette Tusha, the radar operator reported two simultaneous high priority tracks, one consistent with an incoming cruise missile and the other a fast moving surface target. Doctrine and training prioritized the aerial threat. The corvette's command authority ordered an aerial intercept a man-portable or ship-launched infrared-guided interceptor, referred to in the transcript as an IGLA variant. A system with an estimated unit cost of roughly $50,000 was launched from an MI-8 helicopter overhead. Sensors and crews concentrated on the presumed missile, and for a moment, the convoy's defensive focus narrowed to one locus. That narrowed attention was the tactical objective, enabling activation of Vector 3's payload release. With attention redirected, the SEEB's mission shifted to Trojan Horse employment. A hatch opened and four nano-FPV drones were expelled vertically. Small, remotely piloted platforms, roughly the size of a shoebox, were expelled vertically. Their motors brought them to hover. Then they pitched forward into coordinated attack formation. The transcript describes this as the tri-vector assault, the decoy to draw radar and interceptors. The Nano Swarm to engage and fix local defenses, and the Seab itself to close and deliver a heavy warload. The Interceptor successfully engaged and destroyed the decoy. Russian crews celebrated what they believed to be an effective defense. That celebration lasted barely a second. The single contact multiplied into five distinct threats on Tucha's screens. Two fast skim contacts to port, two to starboard, and one large surface missile bearing on the convoy. The situation rapidly transitioned from single-axis defense to a distributed multi-axis engagement. 
The Corvette ordered CIWS and point defense measures to engage the surface contacts, and its automatic cannons, along with those on the cargo ship, spun to life. Together, they produced a combined volume of suppressive fire, described in the transcript as approximately 10,000 rounds per minute, a continuous wall of tracers intended to shred incoming small aerial and surface threats. Two Russian Hunter counter-UAS drones, referred to in the narrative as Hunter-Killer drones, each with a notional platform cost far above that of the Nano FPVs, were launched from the Corvette to intercept the swarm. What followed was a brief, intense aerial close-quarters engagement. On the port flank, Ukrainian operators deliberately exploited the limitations of the CIWS engagement envelope. The automatic cannons had restricted depression angles and difficulty engaging contacts, skimming the sea surface at very low altitude. One Ukrainian operator elected to maneuver a nano drone towards the CIWS fire, using the tracer stream as moving concealment and bait, pulling the hunter under the CIWS umbrella. The Russian hunter-killer drone pursued that contact into the CIWS umbrella and was destroyed, apparently by friendly defensive fire. The port flank was momentarily cleared. On the starboard side, a different sequence unfolded. A second hunter closed on two Ukrainian nanodrones. One Ukrainian operator diverted and drew the hunter's attention, while the other accelerated toward the primary objective. The diverting operator then executed a deliberate collision course, a sacrificial kinetic intercept, a low-cost nanodrone for a high-value hunter drone. The exchange removed a hunter from play and opened a clear lane toward the port Olia 4. In under a minute, the flanking hunter drones were neutralized, one by friendly fire induced collision with defensive fire, the other by a kamikaze interception. Three Ukrainian nano FPVs remained and advanced unopposed on the high value targets. The sequence highlights a key tactical logic. Use low cost expendables to overload decision cycles and to create asymmetric value exchanges. Cost ratios in the transcript are explicit. The nano platforms cost a few hundred dollars a piece. The Hunter and Corvette interceptors represented orders of magnitude greater expense. The three surviving nano drones closed on Port Olia 4. Deck crews responded with small arms and crew served weapons, AK 74s, PKM machine guns, and at least one DP 61 grenade launcher are reported to create a close in defensive barrage. The environment became a chaotic point defense shootout. Tracers, shrapnel, and smoke reduced operator situational awareness. One portside nano was struck in the air and lost. Another pressed an attack run and impacted a propeller. Its 0.4 kilogram shaped charge detonated, producing a focused armor piercing effect. Molten jet perforated the propeller blade, shattering it and seizing the drive shaft. The two 000 ton cargo vessel lost propulsion and began to drift dead in the water. Attention remained focused on the crippled merchant, and that focus delivered the decisive opportunity for Vector 3. The Sieb, no longer a small blip on radar, resumed its high speed terminal run, described as a 30 foot unmanned surface missile traveling at about 50 miles per hour, and impacted the Corvette. Its hull amidships. A warload the transcript sites at approximately 2,000 pounds, reportedly guided by onboard autonomy. The result was catastrophic, a near simultaneous shockwave and displacement of water that inflicted structural failure, magazine detonation, and rapid loss of the Corvette. The account describes catastrophic structural failure and rapid loss of the Corvette within seconds of the impact. Survivors and debris were left on the surface. The surviving nano drone executed a side impact on Port Olia 4's containerized cargo. Its shaped charge ignited stored Shahed components and packing material, producing a secondary conflagration. Flames, smoke, and subsequent cook-offs of energetic materials rendered the vessel a burning hulk. Deck crews abandoned ship into the cold sea. Within hours, the physical effects rippled into strategic consequences. The destroyed corvette and damaged cargo ship interrupted the maritime supply line used to transport Iranian origin drone components through the Caspian. The operation's authors claimed the loss forced a reroute of shipments overland, increasing transit time and cost, and degrading throughput to the Shahed assembly facility referenced in the narrative. The transcript reports a roughly 30% reduction in production quotas at the Alabar assembly site. Independent confirmation is needed. 
The operational impact extended to air defense posture and ground operations. By denying the anticipated influx of 200 Shahed components, Ukrainian air defense units reportedly encountered reduced saturation pressure. Ground formations exploited this window, according to the report, and advanced to liberate roughly five square miles of occupied territory. Those territorial gains are presented here as reported outcomes linked to the interdiction's operational effects and not as independently confirmed facts. The account frames the strike as a four-layer victory. Tactical surprise at sea, asymmetric cost exchange favoring low-cost munitions, interruption of the logistics chain, and operational follow-on on the ground. Financial arithmetic is emphasized in the original narrative. A $1,200 unmanned surface vessel and low-cost nanodrones neutralized a $50 million corvette and destroyed roughly $100 million worth of cargo, according to the source. These monetary comparisons are intended to illustrate the asymmetric economics of modern small unit maritime warfare. The dollar figures are included as reported estimations within the primary narrative. Satellite imagery attribution in the supplied transcript is noted as coming from NASA's VIR system and is characterized by the narrator as confirming one Corvette sunk, one two, 000 ton cargo ship a total loss and 100 million dollars in destroyed components. This script treats those satellite claims as alleged unless formally corroborated by open, verifiable imagery and independent analysis. Beyond material loss, the episode exposes a doctrinal tension for a fleet split between the Caspian and Black Sea theaters. The Russian fleet's calculus, as framed by the report, now faces a, a dilemma. Concentrate escorts in the Caspian to secure supply lanes and thereby attenuate blockade forces in the Black Sea, or accept continued interdiction risk and prioritize assets elsewhere. Either choice carries operational cost. A redeployment could open Ukrainian opportunities in the Black Sea. Inaction concedes a persistent vulnerability to low-cost, high-tempo, unmanned attacks. Technically, the action underlines three operable lessons. First, sensor prioritization can be exploited by relatively simple decoys when defenders are trained to prioritize high-value airborne threats. Second, low-altitude sea skimming and surface approaches exploit specific mechanical constraints in CIW's depression and engagement arcs. Third, inexpensive disposable platforms can impose disproportional cost on more expensive systems when employed in coordinated time-sensitive combinations. The narrative closes with a forward question rather than a judgment. With maritime logistics exposed to asymmetric unmanned systems, how will naval command structures rebalance escorts and convoy protection between littoral theaters to preserve lines of supply without creating decisive vulnerabilities elsewhere? That strategic choice will shape the next chapter of naval operations in both seas.